Hello, everybody, and welcome to Value Trends' very first ever webinar. And we're kind of excited about this series. Now, we actually did this first webinar live uh, earlier in the week, uh, and what happened was the audio was absolutely atrocious. We had many comments on that, and our apologies for that. So we're re-recording it. We found out one of the problems was using the microphone that we have. So I'm actually using my, my telephone um, to, to record this. So it's much, much better clarity. And um, we'll, we'll uh, you know, you learn as you go sometimes, and that goes with technical analysis too sometimes So in the markets. So today I want to cover the, our first webinar, which is going to be very rudimentary basic. Uh, and some people listening to this uh, webinar are going to be quite familiar and adept at technical analysis, and you may say this is too easy, too basic. But I'm going to ask you to bear with it because you really need to sometimes take a step back and get right back to the basics. And trust me, we're going to go further and further down the rabbit hole as we carry forth in this series. So this is the first and basic one, but uh, it's kind of setting the background. So let's, uh, let's get started. And the, the, the series of webinars are going to look something like this. So if you, if you look on the screen, you'll see we have macro technical analysis. So that includes what we're doing today, but it also includes uh, our barometer uh, indicator that we'll be talking about the construction of. And our next webinar is on January 10th. So uh, you, can, uh, you can listen to that, and, and we'll be covering all the stuff we do, including what we're talking about today. Uh, to identify the strength and trend of the markets, as well as the internal risk, which is which will be the next uh, webinar. From there, we will cover uh, initial uh, technical screens, which are really one of the favorite things we like looking at is breakouts. So we'll have uh, Alex Bozik in our office do the majority of that seminar because he's really doing a lot of the quantitative work with with us, and how and you'll learn how he identifies breakout candidates. And Alex is kind of uh, interested in, in maybe pulling up uh, stock charts, the, the online charting software uh, online, um, and he might be able to answer your questions live at that point with specific stocks and breakouts. So that, that would be kind of fun. Uh, from there, we're going to go into fundamental screening, and that's where I'll bring Craig O'Coin, who is our uh, resident value trend CFA. He's a chartered financial analyst. He's going to talk about once we identify the macro view and, and some breakout candidates, assuming we like the macro view of the market, we're looking, we're looking at some breaking out. Craig will be looking at uh, what is the catalyst for that breakout to actually uh, carry the market forward. You need a fundamental reason to carry a stock forward. Just because the chart is breaking out, it doesn't mean it's going to carry on. Finally, uh, we'll be talking about some portfolio management uh, decisions that we make, such as asset position size, allocation sectors, stuff like that. And last but not least, probably the most important one that we're going to talk about, which is our cell discipline. So that's going to be the first six or so seminars that we do. From there, we do plan on doing more, which could include things like uh, understanding how candlesticks uh, formations work and, uh, and point figure charting, kind of interesting offshoot targets from there. So this will, I think, though this first initial five or six seminars will be uh, a very good introduction to you folks to help you understand how to put your own portfolios together. Okay, so we're uh, just the, the necessary disclaimer, which is that uh, basically the, the bottom line is that the, the contents of the seminar is not investment advice. You have to make your own decisions. So we're not going to be giving specific buy-sell recommendations or anything. This is more um, kind of educational purposes. So let's, uh, let's get into the definition of market timing. And, and this is something that I deal with a lot. And that is, and, and I've been, by the way, I've been in the business since 1990, and I started studying technical analysis in the late 90s. And believe me, in the late 1990s, technical analysis was not what it is today. <clears throat> it was, in fact, very... Uh, almost considered witchcraft, so voodoo, you know. Um, so people used to criticize technicians as being market timers. 
And the problem with that image, in some ways we are, but it, the problem with that image is that, you know, market timing in these people's heads, they would say, well, you can't time the market. And, and uh, their definition of market timing is being able to spot the exact bottom and spot the exact top and know precisely where to sell and buy. Of course, that's not real market timing. And in fact, you'd have to be clairvoyant to be able to do that. Um, all technical analysis does, and all we're going to talk about through this series, whenever we talk about even fundamental analysis, is the control of risk. So I, I liken it to crossing a busy highway versus crossing a quiet street. So here in Ontario, which is where, where our office is located, we have a series of highways called the 400 series highways. And these highways have like four lanes going each way. And people drive you know, up to 120 kilometers an hour on these highways. So if you were to try to run across all eight lanes in total, uh, you, you know, with all these cars uh, in different lanes going 120 kilometers an hour, your chances of getting across the highway alive are, are low. So you could say it's a high-risk trade. Um, but it doesn't discount the fact that you very well could get across. Okay, In fact, I've seen people do it. <laughs> Probably drunk people, but whatever the case, I've seen people make it across the highway. Uh, so you, you uh, not often, mind you, because it's illegal, but uh, whatever the case, there's always a possibility of, of making money, so to speak, in a high-risk environment, but it doesn't discount the fact that there is risk. And same with the quiet road. Uh, if you cross a quiet road, your, your chances of getting across it alive are very, very high. So it's a low-risk environment, but it doesn't mean there's no risk. A car could come around the corner that you didn't suspect was going to come and they, they, you know, maybe going, uh, you know, flooring it and, uh, and who knows why, some, some uh, kids out on a joyride, and you could get hit by that car. So even though you're in a low-risk environment, doesn't mean there was no risk on the street. And same with the stock market. If it all looks good, doesn't mean that the market can't uh, come up and bite you in the bum. So um, let's, let's look at the, the basics then of understanding how we can control that risk-reward ratio. So understanding there's always risk, there's always reward, but there's certain things we can do to try to uh, control that risk. So we're going to look at basic trend and support resistance and phases in the markets. Okay, we'll, we'll get in a little bit into cycles today, but the most important thing about today is, is the trend analysis. So this stuff, as I said, is going to be basic to some of you, but I want you to bear with me because it, it's a refresher and it never hurts to go back to this stuff. So this is a, a mock um, chart of a sideways trading period. And what you can see is that, let's pretend the lower level is $5 and the upper level is $10. And what you can see is that whenever this make-believe stock or the stock market or index hits $5, uh, it tends to bounce off of that and go up to $10. So you can see this stock had been $10, fell to 5 went up to 10 fell back down to 5 went up to 10 And, and uh, well, the relationship between support, where the $5 level, uh, time after time is not precise, there's usually a zone of where support will come in. The reason support occurs is because just think of yourself as the, the, uh, the person that missed, say it was at $5 and you watched it go to 10, you're kind of wishing that you could get it at $5. Uh, you missed out on that last you know, excellent entry point. So the next time it gets near $5, you're, you're saying to yourself, boy, if I can ever get that stock near $5, I'm on it. So that, so as soon as it hits $5 or gets close to it, maybe $6, you're, you're buying it because you remember that it went to 10 Now, the same thing happens with resistance except the opposite mentality, which is this stock was at $10, it fell to 5 Well, you know, if you held the stock at $10 because somebody owned it, somebody bought it there at $10, and if you bought at $10 and you watched it fall to five, you know, I don't have to really guess what your thought process is, which is, man, if that stock ever gets back to $10, I'm selling it because I just literally lost my shirt on this stock. So as soon as it gets back to $10, there's selling pressure. There's people like me and you who bought the stock at 10 and wish they could get their money back. So it, it literally creates a wall of resistance. So as we know, stocks often break out eventually to the upside, or they might break down where support is no longer held. That's usually driven by a catalyst, but it's, it's the first thing we need to understand is that support and resistance are real. They're not just lines on a chart. It's because real people and even institutions are paying attention to patterns or just people are having emotional reactions to where they 
missed out on opportunities or uh, maybe didn't, uh, you, you know, maybe want to get their money back. Okay, so let's go to some real live examples of when you could see markets go sideways. And you can see this is the S and P 500 between 2014 to 16, and uh, you can see, you know, support was around 1870 back. Uh, in 2014, and that support level where buyers would come in was a very, you know, very short-term period where it dropped below that. But generally speaking, around 1870, you would see, or 1860 or so, the market really found buyers, and that's because the person that watched, you know, we'd go from 1870 up to 2100 or so, was saying to them. So if it ever goes down to 1870, I'll buy again. So uh, it's, just, it's the same principle. This time, eight, uh, 2130, somebody bought there, and then they watch it go down back down to 1870, and they say, man, if I could only you know get my money back. And so it did rally back close enough to that 2130 area. I think it had 2120 here. Sure enough, sellers came in, and it sold off again. So this is real people uh, trading, and that's the reason why these, these patterns occur. And you can see they occur through time. So here we have the Dow Jones Industrial Average since 1900, and you can see that there have been many periods where we have sideways consolidations and the market is contained between a support and resistance level. Now again, you draw these lines with a crayon because sometimes you'll see breakdowns below support, but the, the main thing we're looking for is a pattern, and you can see, for example, this was a breakout, but it was a false breakout, went right back into that zone before it finally broke out for real back in the 40s. Uh, that was after the 29 crash, the Great Depression. Here we have probably the most dominant sideways market in, in history, which was between 1965 and 82, something like 17 years, where the Dow could not crack 1,000. There was a couple lows, like this was the era when Nixon was impeached, but there was, there was the Cuban Missile Crisis in there as well. I think it was that around here. Um, but e either way, the, the market couldn't break 1,000, and finally it did. It broke out, tested a little bit, and boom, greatest bull market in all history, even greater than the one we've been in um, over the past decade or so. So we did have another sideways period here. It did break out on the Dow. The S&P, by the way, did not break out to this high. Only the Dow Industrials did. Um, so it's important to pay attention to both indexes. But you can see, even with that minor breakout, it failed and fell right back down pretty much precisely to support. So this happens. Eventually, stocks break out or markets break out. Now, sometimes they break out to the bottom, but just be aware that the markets don't stay stagnant. But while they're going sideways or tra trading within a range, you must assume they're going to remain in that range until a breakout occurs. Okay. So this is the TSX right up to a week ago from this recording, and you can see there have been many lids on the TSX uh, support levels as well, but the lids on the TSX are very dominant at resistance levels, and sure enough, we seem to be breaking out of one right now. Um, this is the Canadian banks. Again, the chart was taken about a week ago. I mean, Canadian banks have always been considered stalwart investments, things, something you can own for the long term, but really, I mean, for capital gain perspective, they do pay high dividends, from a, but from a capital gains perspective, there is a massive lid on the Canadian banks. This is the BMO uh, Equal Weight Bank ETF, and you can see, boom, somewhere around 30 and a half on this index, the, the, the banks like hit precisely that level. I mean, you talk about precise. So this is definitely buyer memory. Um, so, you, you know, you can see, once again, precisely 30 and a half started to fall. And I'm, I'm recording this today, and I know this is CIBC just recorded uh, terrible um, numbers. So there, you know, this is going to be lower than when this chart was first printed a, a week ago. So, um, you know, it's no coincidence that this stuff happens, all right? So that's, that's support and resistance, and that ties into the principle of trend analysis. You guys are probably aware of this. You know, an uptrend is signified by higher highs and higher lows, so peaks and troughs. Downtrend is lower highs, lower lows. The one thing you got to keep in mind is that when you don't have higher highs and higher lows, or lower highs and lower lows, then you have a consolidation. So that's one of those sort of sideways consolidations. As you can see, usually a transition between a downtrend and an uptrend, you'll get a couple of peaks that are the same. That's one of the signs, it's called the base, that we're possibly going to break out into a new trend, but you don't buy until uh, it actually is uh, broken out. Okay, uh, let's look at a real live stock with uh, higher highs, higher lows, been a long-term downtrend, a little known company that very few of you I'm sure are aware of called Google. 
I really hear good things about these guys. Apparently, they're big in the internet. Um, tongue in cheek here. So you can see Google has had many periods where it's had massive ceilings, massive support or resistance ceilings. And sure enough, uh, they break out time after time. Sometimes they're small consolidations. But uh, the point I want to show you is that just because you're in a consolidation, you don't make an assumption that the trend is over. Now, if the, if the consolidation breaks down, so in this case, say if Google had broken support in a meaningful way and the trend line, yes, you can assume that the trend is over, but not until then, okay? So uh, here we are right now. It looks like there was a bit of a ceiling on Google, and there was some good news that came out on Google uh, at the time of this recording about a week ago, and it looks like it's trying to break out. So again, that consolidation on Google did not mean the trend was over, uh, and, and it needed to prove otherwise before you assume the trend is over. So uh, let's look at the, the phases of a market, and this ties into all the stuff we just looked at. Uh, this is in my book, Sideways, and you can buy a copy of the book if you, you want better clarification on these points. But here we go, higher highs, higher lows, and above. I'm using a 30-week moving average in this diagram. I really should have used a 40-week line because that's the 200-day moving average, but whatever. Uh, what I want you to pay attention to is higher highs and higher lows is an uptrend. Um, no longer higher highs and higher lows is a consolidation, and lower highs and lower lows is a downtrend. You know, which could could uh, end with a series of no more lower highs and lower lows, uh, and often a, the moving average will support the uptrend, will um, will indicate the downtrend is still in place, and when you're in a consolidation, the moving the market moves up and down around the uh, uh, the, the moving average. Okay, so real life in technicolor period of. Uh, the different phases you can see the market had during the 2000s right until the breakout in 2013 really uh, been in a you know a fairly highly resistant market but it was going through the different phases you can see that lower highs lower lows consolidation you know no more uh, lows and highs that are taking each other out and then a breakout boom over and over okay so sometimes you get faked out by, by this stuff. I got faked out in 2016. You can see there's a low, there's a low, which was lower. There's a high, this high was actually lower. It broke the moving average. We actually sold uh, some stocks in to that early 2016. The market rallied right back up and we went back in. But most of the time, using a rule of a break of the moving average and a new low and a new lower high, that often saves your bacon. And in fact, one of our bragging points is that in 2008, we didn't lose nearly as much as the market and we were recovered almost fully by the first, uh, but literally by the end of 09 and the market didn't uh, recover until 2013. So, you know, we, we used a sell signal um, back then and uh, it helped us out. No, it didn't help us out in 2016, so it's not infallible, but you can always go back in. The worst that happens is you underperform a little bit, but the, the, the best that can happen is you miss out on some ugliness. And in, in, in these two markets, missing out would have been a really good thing to have happen to you. So uh, I'll now go to uh, the, you know, some of the stocks that you know, are currently in obvious uptrends. And you can see this is the 30-year uh, bond. And really, even though there's been a little bit of bearishness lately on the 30-year bond, you can see the 30-year bond has been in a big uptrend since 1991. So really, it ain't over until it's over. And it has not taken out a dominant low for a while. So we must assume that the bigger trend is in place for the 30-year bond until this last low, which is around 135, is taken out. Okay? It could consolidate, but it's... It, it, trend is not necessarily over just yet. Now here we have the Commodity Research Bureau Index, and you can definitely see that this is a volatile index, but what I want you to notice here is that it is more or less consolidating. There's a definitely a support level, somewhere around 170, and a resistance level, somewhere around 200 bucks, okay? It is what it is. It's, it's not an uptrending market, it's not a downtrending market, so it's obviously a market that favors trading, trading that consolidation, okay? Um, Canadian dollar. A lot of people are excited by the strength in the Canadian dollar, which is really based on the weakness in the U.S. dollar. But the big picture is pretty questionable. You can see the big red line I've drawn here. That's the mega trend that's been in place since 2012. It's 
and down. It's got a number of different channels. You can see one here as well, but different different down training channels. Maybe it's breaking out because you you don't seem to have that kind of you know there's a high there and that high was taken out. Maybe that low has been taken out here, but it doesn't really seem to be kind of cooperating. This last peak is about the same as there. So I'm going to call this kind of a consolidation. I'm not sure if this downtrend is broken yet. So again, this isn't a perfect arc, but we can definitely make an observation on the, on the Canadian dollar that there's something happening. It's not necessarily bullish, but it's not necessarily bearish anymore. It's kind of a wait and see. And so sometimes you just have to do that. Whereas when it was trending in these channels, with lower highs, lower lows, you definitely knew the market was down for the Canadian dollar. So my own thoughts are that I, I think this, this downtrend channel is pretty strong. Uh, it doesn't really seem to be breaking out with any conviction, so you know I, I'm not sure that I'd be super bullish on the Canadian dollar, but it may consolidate for a while sideways. So um, cycles, we'll just briefly cover this. Uh, this is a make-believe cycle of six weeks. Cycles are always measured from trough to trough, so that's important for you to understand. Now, the other thing, the important thing to understand is that cycles are not necessarily, if it's a six-week cycle, you don't circle the calendar to the day. It's, it's kind of another crayon rule. You, you draw the line of where the cycle may occur with a crayon. Because it, it uh, and, and eventually, another thing that I've noticed is that cycles end. So let's take a look at some cycles. This is a great example of a very, very predictable cycle that happened in that big sideways market we were talking about. There's the impeachment of uh, Nixon um, right there. So, you know, where the Dow is trapped at 1,000, but roughly every four years or so, but you can see it's not precise, but fairly close to every four years, there was a trough. Remember, they measured trough to trough. But then it broke out. When, when the Dow broke that 1,000 lid, okay, boom, the cycle ended. And that whole four, four year or so, four, four year or so cycle ended, okay? So let's look at the S&P 500. I was noticing that between the Asian contagion of 1998 and you know, the, uh, the tech crash and then the subprime crash seemed to be a bit of a five-year cycle. So I drew a cycle zone here uh, where it, it theoretically would have occurred, but when the S&P took out its ceiling, which was around 1,500 or so, boom, the cycle ended. Okay? So, again, cycles don't last forever. You can, you can uh, observe them. And if, you do see, if I did see a turn on around here, then, then it would be a continuation of that, cycle, that sideways market and that cycle. But, you know, you have to keep an open mind. So just one of the things we as technical people have to do is keep an open mind to all possibilities. And here is a, a, uh, an indicator that I get on my screen when a stock breaks out. Anyways, um, Dow, another cycle is seasonality. Some of you have heard of that. Uh, Dow Jones, S&P, TSX all have a similar cycle, which tend to move up between October and May, and to, tend to do relatively less uh, performance over the summer. So uh, it's something you can you can definitely pay attention to. It's not something you can definitely assume that's going to happen every year. Uh, but the reason behind these figures brought to us by Brooke Thackeray in his brand new uh, Thackeray's Guide, he shows us that, uh, you know, between May and October, if you put 10 grand in since 1950, you would have lost $1,400 bucks versus if you had bought October and sold in May, you'd made $1.8 million. The rhetorical question being, what would you have rather done? Um, the reason for this massive discrepancy in performance it's not that every single summer the markets go down, because you guys know that's not the case, but it's that when the markets go down, they typically do get hammered hardest in the summer, if they're going to be hammered. And of course, that, there's been enough big, you know, bad markets over the, over the past 69-year period that uh, have, have resulted in enough losses that, that created this, uh, this figure of a $1,400 loss, even though markets in general went up over that long-term period. So um, there are subsectors, seasonal cycles, such as, you know, a lot of people might be aware of energy that does tend to move up uh, as the driving season approaches. Infotech, as, you know, Christmas and the uh, big tech shows come out, and, and, and the companies like Apple and stuff sort of start announcing their new phones and whatnot in the fall. So there's, there's certain um, tendencies for some of the sectors to move up at different times of the year. The rules of thumb, 
they're not absolutes, but they're definitely something that uh, we at the IE Trend use, we keep in mind. Uh, presidential cycle. Uh, actually, the presidential cycle has been pretty amazingly accurate under the, um, under the, the, uh, the presidency of uh, Donald Trump. Um, like him or hate him, the, uh, the, it's certainly been a pretty good market to, uh, <laughs> uh, to have him as president in. Um, and, you know, here we are in relatively, it's been a fairly choppy second half. Yes, it's, it's higher, it's broken out, but you can see that, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, the election year, uh, was definitely very good as well as, well as the post election year. Um, and last year, this would have been 2018, the midterm was very flat, you'll remember. So generally speaking, um, the, the, uh, the presidential cycle has been working very well uh, with, with Trump. And uh, it would indicate that we may have another bump up uh, after the second half of next year. Okay? Um, so I'll finish up with the uh, note of our blog, which some of you might already read the blog, but it's available at valuetrend.ca. And you can also uh, catch the blog by uh, following us on Twitter, because Alex in our office tweets out uh, notices on the blog twice a week, because we tend to blog twice twice a week. Okay. Um, final thing is that you can also, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about over the, the webinars are uh, are in my book sideways. So uh, I wrote that book for retail investors, and I know many of you watching this video will have maybe read my books. So uh, I, I do encourage you to, especially for the audience that's watching this particular webinar, would probably enjoy reading sideways. Okay? Thank you for joining me, and we'll uh, hopefully see you January 10th.